Okay, I presume you can you can see the slides now, yeah? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. So um first of all, first we didn't have uh, any this thing last week because of the prayer, praying and fasting session. So but we are starting from uh, chapter 18 now. We've done chapter 17, our sister took us through chapter 17. So we're going to start from chapter 18 today. And the theme of this chapter 18 will be the qualities and attitudes of kingdom citizens. So we need to see what these qualities and these attitudes will be as we go along. Um, so let us read... Um, I think what I will probably do, let's 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 read it and then we can then one by one go through the verses. So if we probably if you have your Bibles, we go to Matthew chapter 18 and then probably read the mess first 12 to 15 verses and then we Take it on, see how far we can reach, and then finish it off next week. So Matthew 18, verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Verse 6. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses comes. Verse 8. If your hands, hand and or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, plug it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a, a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying. And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over the sh that ship than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Uh, moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. I will stop in verse 15, and then we go back and look at the verses one by one. Right, so where we started, the verse 1, it said, uh, assuredly, it said, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven at that time? So at the, the word at that time means that there are things that happened before this time, which I have to probably remind you of. I think what the, the things that happened was, if we looked at verse uh, chapter 16, 
where Jesus asks the disciples who he, he really is. And uh, Peter answered him that you are Christ, the son of the living God. So that, um, obviously we know that what follows after that, that Christ made a proclamation that on this rock, obviously the name of uh, Simon was pronounced as Peter from then. And then he said, upon this rock, that he will uh, build his church. Obviously the rock, not Pet is not. we didn't say it was Peter, but it was that proclamation that Christ is, is the Christ and that is the son of the living God. So, so that is one of the things that happened. So what we are trying to see now is to see, you know, those scenarios whereby the disciples would have been thinking of each other, that they, you know, are they not this uh, the greatest? Obviously, you know, Peter can claim from what has happened there that you know he's he's a good contender. After all, he answered that question very well, you know, and Christ praised him for it. Um, but when we move on slightly, we also saw the incidents of uh, Christ taking the three, Peter, James, and John, to the transfiguration, where he actually manifests his glory to them. Again, there, we saw that, you know, they really saw this. But what is amazing also is that he told them not to tell anybody, even including the other nine disciples. So that was something that will make us to think that, you know, these are people from the inner circle. You know, like it looks as if they are the VIP. So again, it could make them to think, could it be one of three of them who could be the greatest in the kingdom of, of, of heaven? So that is also something to, to think about. And then later still, we found out, you know, when they came, actually came back from the mountain, uh, that um, they were, the other disciples were trying helplessly to cast a demon out of a young boy. And we saw how Christ rebuked them that, you know, instead of them trying to cast this in, 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 in his name, they should have relied in his presence, uh, you know, and his help rather than, you know, calling on his name. And again, here, we could see that he wasn't with the three. So could it be that the three could look at themselves to say, mm, if we were here, we could have, you know, done it. So again, there is that class sort of uh, battle going on there. And then we come to the time that uh, Jesus told Peter to go out to catch a fish uh, and uh, that there will be a coin in the mouth of the fish, which Peter should use to pay his temple tax, both for himself and for Christ. Again, you know, could, could, Peter could claim there that it's only him that Christ did this, put in this sort of class. You know, he didn't even, the, the three of them that went to the, uh, the transfiguration, you know, were dropped out of this. So seeing that Christ chose him to go and get this coin to pay for the tax of Peter and Christ, could have made him to think, well, it could be him who is the, who should be the greatest. But the problem we have here is actually started, even the in Matthew didn't give the account, we were given the account, even in the Gospel of Luke, that they were while they were traveling, the disciples were traveling, that they started disputing amongst themselves who was the greatest. If you look at Luke chapter nine, verse forty-six, um, you know, so that 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 argument took place, and also the um, if we look at Mark as well, the Gospel of Mark, we also saw that. Uh, the disciples, when they got into the house at Capernaum, you know, Jesus actually knew what they were arguing about, and he actually asked them, what are you people arguing about? So they were quite embarrassed uh, among themselves, but they know that Christ already knows, so that is why they continued anyway to ask this question. That, that is where we then come to this verse 1 to say, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. One thing is clear here 
what is clear here is it is a, a sad fact that whenever we experience the riches of God's grace towards us, we so often start to think about how wonderful we, we must be rather than how wonderfully gracious God is. Okay, so you can see here, you know, Christ has opened the door. He has, you know, been nice to them. He has made them to feel, you know, sort of somebody, put them in a hierarchy, VIP position. That is not the time to start thinking of how great you are. That is the time to thank God for being gracious to you. So that this, this is also something we need to learn in our own lives as Christians. You know, whenever God is blessing us, whenever God is, you know, elevating us, whenever the presence of God is with us, we should, it's not the time to think of how important you are. It's, it's actually the time to give God back the glory and say, God, thank you for what you have done. It's not the time for you to think who, who, who how many people are you, uh, is above you, that every, you know, maybe others should worship you. Okay, so that is a lesson we need to learn from here. So let us go to the, our study today. So as we can see what from what we have read and what I have narrated to you, so they were concerned about the, the issue of greatness, the sick, the question, you know, they thought Christ should choose among them who will be the greatest in this, you know, obviously the kingdom that Christ will uh, establish. So, so, you know, that, that argument, we could imagine it going on before them. And any of them could think that they, have the, they could have a shot at it, particularly Peter, if we look at what, what he has actually done. So Spot John made a statement here. He said he spoke of his abasement, they thought of their own advancement, and that at the same time. So just imagine, this is the Christ who was, who was actually going to be put to the cross to be crucified. Here he is making the final preparations, telling them what is going to happen. And here they are trying to, to decide who should be the greatest in the kingdom that Christ is going to establish. Isn't it quite ironous with things that can happen to us in these days? Okay, so obviously they wanted to know who would, they, who would hold the highest position in the administration that Christ was soon established. Okay, so that, as I said, uh, it's just, they are just thinking as in the human sense, you know, in these days of politics, you know, when, you, when your friend, you know, becomes the prime minister, becomes the president, obviously he's going to dish out the ministerial posts. So that is how these people are thinking. They are actually thinking in the earthly manner rather than thinking about something eternal. Okay, so what did Jesus do? He called out a child and set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whosoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest. So this is absolutely a surprise to them that he will give this example. They thought, you know, it will be one of them, but Jesus, you know, he might even have answered the question to them by telling them that, you know, it is himself really, because he, he is the only one who fulfills that criteria. But he drew his attention to a, a little child. So this attention, to the child is, is to express his nature, really, of who he is, okay? So the fact that uh, Christ um, called a child, you know, says something about who he is. You know, he was that sort of man that children would come to willingly. Uh, it also tells us something about Peter because if Peter was to be regarded as the first pope, the way the popes are regarded in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, he would have been the one Christ would have chosen, but it's, it's, it's not like that. And he warns them to say, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so th this was probably a great disappointment to the disciples. You know, wh why is it a disappointment? Because in those days, 
Now, children were regarded more as property than as individuals. So it was under, understood that they were to be seen and not to be heard. Just like today, you know, they are children. Nobody takes them serious. So Jesus said that we have to take this kind of humble place of a child in order to enter the kingdom of God. So, uh, and that was something that surprised them. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. Yes, okay. So move on, yes. Now, a child. So let's look a little bit into what a child is really. Um, a child was a person of no importance in the Jewish society, okay? They are subject to the authority of his elders or his parents. They are not taken seriously, except taking them as your responsibility to look after them than to bring them up really. You know, they are one to be looked after, not one to be looked up on, looked up to. So I think it's not only to the Jewish society. I think that same concept is still applicable today. We don't, we don't take children seriously, do we? Everything they do, oh, he's a child. We don't take them seriously. But there are certain things in them that we need to learn to, to, to behave like. Okay, so children, again, let us look at some of the other qualities they have. They are not threatening, okay? Children are not threatening at all. Would anybody say they will be threatened by meeting a, a five-year-old in a, in a dark alley when they are walking in the night, okay? Uh, so when we have a tough, intimidating presence, we are, we are not like Jesus. Children are also not good at deceiving. You see, anytime they want to deceive, we always catch them, okay? They are pretty miserable failures at fooling their parents, okay? When we are good at hiding ourselves and deceiving others, then we are not like Christ. The child, a child is held up as an ideal, not of innocence or purity or faith, but of the humility of, of or, and his own concern for social status. Have we ever seen a child who is just too eager to be uh, something in the society? They will dream, but they, they are usually not serious about it. Even when they talk about it, we laugh, we laugh over it, okay? But that their humility, that their innocence, you know, that, that is what really, sets them apart. Um, and they don't, they, they are not good at lying. They say things as, as it is, you know. Um, Jesus knew that we must be converted, you know, to be like children, okay? It isn't in our nature to be, to take this low place and to humble ourselves. No, it is not. A lot of people don't like taking that low place. We want all to be elevated. We want all to be seen. Uh, not to, not to talk of being humble, yeah. So, but that is the standard that is required. And he continues to say that whosoever humbles himself as this little children is the greatest. So Jesus then addresses the issue of greatness, greatness. So when we must fulfill the humble place a child had in that culture, we, we are then on our way to greatness in the in His kingdom. So that's that's what He's trying to tell us. Yeah. Okay. So we, we move on. Okay, so the, the issue here, when it says humble humility, it's, it's all about taking an inferior position, accepting an inferior position, as our Lord Jesus Christ did in Philippians 2.8, okay, where the same phrase is used, okay? Children do not try to be humble, they are so. And the same is the case with really gracious people. Spurgeon says here that the imitation of humility is sickening, but the reality is attractive. Yes, when you are truly humble, it attracts. But when you are putting up the, the, the humility, when, when you are not, it's sickening. In fact, some people might find it infuriating. It's better you don't even do that. Yeah, but true humility is quite attractive. People would like to know who you are. They want to know why you are behaving like this, you know, there is really attractive. And it's something that we need to uh, try to, to do. But we also know that one man was actually the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is, and that, that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. 
This means that Jesus himself was humble like a child. He wasn't concerned about his own status. Okay, if, if just imagine if he was to be a human being with all those richness, riches that he has and everything. Oh, he'll be bullying everybody and, and throwing people up and down. But he wasn't concerned about his own status as the son of God. He didn't have to be the center of attention. He, he, he wasn't, he wasn't bothered. He could not deceive. And he didn't have any intimidating presence. Yeah, when we look at when Christ was moving, he, 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 he was very simple. It was very simple. It wasn't very posh at all. So that tells us the sort of person he is. Okay, then the Bible continues in verse five to six. It says, whosoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me, but whosoever causes one of these little ones uh, who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a male stone we are hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So strong language there, strong language there, but uh, uh, let, let us uh, look at it closely. Um, um, okay, so it is easy to, in this society we live, even as we are talking now, it is always easy to despise the humble. They are, they are usually the ones people regard as losers, the kind that will never make it in, in this our competitive world. And, and uh, yet, when we despise humble people, we also despise Christ. That is what Christ doesn't want us to despise this, his little ones and humble ones. So whosoever causes his little ones to, who believe in me to sin, now, the, when the word little ones here, it doesn't necessarily mean children, but it also means anybody who is humble, who have humbled themselves as children in the manner Jesus Christ have described. So it doesn't particularly mean children, but it also means adults who have humbled themselves as children. Um, but what we are trying to learn here is that it is a wicked thing to sin. It is even far greater evil to lead others into sin. I think it's, it is very important that we mark this today. You know, uh, Christ sees it act actually as a very, very big problem and, and sin when we lead others to sin. Yeah, so please examine yourselves. Leading others to sin can be very subtle. You know, let us make sure that we are not doing that because there are consequences. There are consequences. Uh, so that we can, we have seen one of them there. He has pronounced something there that was looked quite severe. He said it would be better for the, anybody who has led one of his little ones to sin that a, a millstone be hung around his neck and to be drowned. This, he says it's better. This is actually not the complete punishment. Okay, this is not the complete punishment. So getting you to be uh, put the millstone on your neck and throwing you millstone, uh, throwing the person to, to the sea. Obviously, a stone hung, hung, hung on, on your neck will take you down straight away. Uh, you are drowning. But he it says it's, it's, it's better. So this is actually not the full punishment. Okay? So the full punishment, I presume, will still be something to do with going to hell. So... Please, it's a severe punishment that is described here. It would be better for the offending one to receive this punishment than even, you know, sort of going to hell. So let us um, know that causing somebody who is regarded as these little ones who are humble before God to sin is a serious, serious matter. You should please take note. And the other thing I wanted to touch to you about there is that the issue of drowning somebody through hanging a stone on their neck is never a Jewish uh, punishment. It's a Roman punishment. It was a Roman punishment. So the Jews dread it. They don't like it. So we continue. It's a war to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but war to that man by whom the offense comes. Very clear. I mean, this world we live in is a, is a broken world already. We know that offenses will come, but let it not come by through you. That's what we're talking here. 
Okay, so the first war is a cry of pity for the a world in danger of offenses. The second war is a warning to the one who brings or introduces evil to others. Okay, so really, we need to be careful that we are not that person who will be, who will be held uh, guilty of, of uh, you know, trying to bring offense to others. Okay, so what to the man by whom the offense comes? So we live in a fallen world and it is inevitable that sin and hurt and offenses will come. Yet the person who brings offenses is guilty before God. I have no excuse. I have no excuse at all. So let us uh, make sure that it's not, it's not us. So here we have... Um, Verse eight to nine is talking about uh, some ways we could try not to sin. Uh, the Bible has stood out there. If you know we've read it before, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, plug it off. Blah blah blah. So the only thing we I need to tell you here is that let us not look take this literally to sort of self mutilating our bodies. That's not what the, this thing is. It's rather a, caution, a warning for us to change in the way we do things in our attitude and make some sacrifices in order to correct certain things. Um, so here, um, you said if your hand or foot causes to sin, cut it off. So as I said before, some people uh, only keep from sin if it is easy or convenient to do so. So Jesus wants us that we must be willing to sacrifice in fighting against sin. Uh, that nothing is worse than facing the wrath of a righteous God. It is really better to sacrifice in the battle against sin now than to face the punishment of eternity later. Please. And then if your eye causes you to sin, plug it out. That, now, there are significant problems in taking this words, as I said before, literally, uh, as a literal instruction, rather than co co them conveying a, an attitude to us. Okay, the problem is not from the obvious physical harm that one might bring upon themselves, but more so in the problem that bodily mutilation does not go far enough in controlling sin. Yeah. Yeah. So we the, the, the essence of all this is that we need to be transformed from inside out. Inside out. Let me tell you why body mutilation is not going to solve the problem. If you cut off your right hand, you can still sin with the left hand. Or if you if your left eye is gorged out, your right eye can still sin. Or if all your even, even if all your members, all your body parts have been cut off. You can still sin in your heart and mind. So, so Christ calls us to a far more radical transformation than any sort of bodily mutilation. It doesn't work. The, so what he was tell, saying there is just a sacrifice. He doesn't want us to say, ah, if your hand has made you to sin, just go get, get a knife, cut it off. No, no, no. That won't stop you from sinning. Because the, 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 the left hand is there to still do the same thing. So the, the issue is transformation from within, transformation from the heart and the mind. That's where the battle lies. But obviously, there is a sense in saying that if, obviously, you know, if it is your eye that is causing you to sin, the transformation still have to come from inside because you can make that decision not to use that eye. You don't have to pluck it out, but you can close it or you can look away. Yeah, those are the other forms a transformed heart works. So another uh, verse 10 is talking about, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven there are angels. See again, a warning there. Uh, because God's mind and eyes is always on his little ones. We do, we do well to treat them with love and respect. Uh, God protects the humble. And the sense of the angels there is that 
you know, we, we don't usually have one angel. We use we do have angels that are guiding over us. We make reference on that Hebrew uh, one fourteen. So you know, let us uh, be aware of that as well. Now let us um, continue. Uh, verse eleven to fourteen talked about you know the uh, 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 shepherd who has lost one uh, who had a uh, hundred sheep and lost one, okay, and how he left the ninety nine and went on to to look for the one that have strayed away. Okay, so I'm pretty sure. It sounds like something we've had before. Yeah. So let us look at that. Let's look at that. Um, now, in what we have read in that, what looks like a parable, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountain to seek the one that is trained? So when we look at this story, it actually looks, uh, it, it, it demonstrates the, the, the value of love God places on individuals. Uh, Jesus exhorts us to reflect in the, in, on, in, in the same care. Uh, also, when you read it, this parable, at the first sight, you will think it's, uh, it's similar, but yet different to the parable of the lost, lost uh, sheep that, we, that is recorded in Luke 15, 3 to 7. So the evidence suggests that these are two similar parables. Uh, both are taught by our Lord Jesus Christ, but with different aims. Okay, here Jesus emphasizes the love and care we should have for all in the Christian community. That's what this is all about here. Okay, uh, well, you could look at it and say the first temptation is to despise one because it's only one. You know, we can say, mm, well, if it is one out of 99, why bother? The 99 is, a, is, is enough. Let's let's get on with it and leave that one. The, the next thing is that you need you can despise one because that is so little. Again, you know, can grade people and say mm, it's not even as, as important. That that ship is not the most important one, it's not the biggest one. It's probably one of the smallest ones. Let's let's leave it and get along. And uh, perhaps the most dangerous form of temptation is to despise one because that one has gone astray. Hmm. You will say, ah, this ship, what can we do? Do we waste our time looking for it? It's, it's gone, it's gone. Let us please settle with the 99. Why, why do we have to waste our time trying to look for where, where it is? But what we are, God wants us to do is that that one ship is very, very important that we need to put every effort to make sure we find that ship, that that ship should not, you know, be forgotten. Uh, you know, I, I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote here about the one that is straying, okay? It might not be the ship, but there are other things that we can uh, these days look at as if they are straying, for example, if you go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night in the street, you know, you could see drunkards who are swearing, you know, so that is the time to love them, not when they, they are drinking. That time they are swearing and uh, swearing and swearing. That's the time to love them. You know, there are other people who can, you know, apart from people who are swearing and the people who are drunkard, you know, these are very difficult people to, to really <laughs> to really deal with. But that is where the love is. They, they, they are examples of people who are straying. They are the example of the sheep that has gone astray. So that is where we need to show our love most. So this is something for me and you to think about. It's not easy because things are never easy. Um, now, we continue with that parable. Say, if he should find it, I surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep. Right. So the sheep, the shepherd was happy when he found the sheep. 
He wasn't angry or bitter over his hard work or lost time. You know, in these days, if it was us, we say, ah, you, you made me to waste all this time the whole day. I did I, 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 I'm supposed to go there. I'm supposed to go there. I didn't go because of you. First of all, we will lash out our anger in, to, to that person or to that ship that was lost. You know, but here, the shepherd wasn't angry. He wasn't really complaining. His joy was overflowing. So Buckley pointed out that this parable shows us the character of God's love, being like the care a shepherd gives for a lost sheep. That love is an individual love expressed to that individual that has strayed away, individualistic. It is also patient. It is a seeking love because he made sure that he, he went and seek and seek and seek until that lost sheep is found. It is also a rejoicing love because when he found the, the sheep, he was overjoyed. He said that his joy was overflowing and it was also a protecting love. So these are very, very important ways that a Christian can show love, you know, can show individual love, patient love, seeking love, rejoicing love and protecting love. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That is what we need to bear in mind. Okay, should not be that we should bear that in mind that we will always try our best to save, you know, our brother to save any any anybody who is in danger of of perishing. Right. So we we take verse fifteen and probably we stop there and continue uh, next week. I'll, I'll read it. We'll start it off and then we we'll leave it and uh, start continue next week. So verse 15, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, this is a very important topic for us, especially for us Christians, you know, in terms of how we deal with somebody who might have offended us or somebody who we think we have issues with. The Bible is telling us here that we should go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. I know there is a problem here because sometimes we don't even gather the courage to go. Sometimes it depends on who, who has offended you. You could find the person that the person is maybe um, more senior than you in the church or more religious than you, so you won't gather that, that courage to go and tell them what they have done. Uh, some, sometimes, you know, you might just want to bottle it in. So it is essential that we go to the offending brother first, not gossiping, not gripping and gossiping to others, especially under the guise of sharing a prayer request or seeking counsel, okay? Yeah, please, it is not good for you to, uh, somebody has done you a bad thing, instead of you to go and uh, speak to them, you the next thing the person will hear is that you have raised that offense as a, as a prayer request, instead of going to talk to them directly. So that is, that is not good. What you need to do instead is to speak to that party directly. That is what the Bible is telling us to do. I think we need to, uh, with the things I said earlier on, this is an area we are struggling and we will continue to struggle just due to the way this church these days is structured. Uh, most people will not gather the confidence. Again, it depends on who, is, who have offended you. I think most people will, for example, find it easy to go to another congregational member they think they are in the same level with to complain Rather than, for example, if the pastor has done something to go to the pastor and say, Pastor, this thing you did is not good, they will not, they, they might not gather the courage to do that for obvious reasons. But the Bible is saying that, you know, we should go and confront that person, irrespective of their position. You should go and confront them and tell them. So 
it would be wrong for anyone to take Jesus's word here as a command to confront your brother with every sin that they have committed against you. Yes, also some people might not, uh, <laughs> you offend them once, they bucket it, you offend them twice, they don't talk. And then all of a sudden, uh, when it, this, the, the offenses have reached 10 and they will uh, confront you. And instead of settling it, it becomes a fight. So that is also not what the Bible says. The Bible says we should go when, and confront them straight away. But also, the Bible also says we should bear with one another and be long-suffering towards each other. Yet clearly, there are some things that we cannot suffer long with, and we must address it. Yeah, If, if you are led by the Holy Spirit to sort of forget about something that you think somebody has done and you thought, look, this is this is really not what, you know, sort of thinking about. Yes, that uh, bearing with one another, you can use it to finish it off, but let it go out of your heart though. It's not that you are bearing with one another yet. You haven't forgotten the grudge. The, the grudge. You are still bearing grudge against them. So we can say that Jesus gives us two options when your brother sins against you. You can go to him directly and deal with it, or you can drop the matter on that Christian long suffering and bearing with one another. That two options are fine. Now, other options like holding on onto bitterness, retaliation, gossiping to others about the problem are not allowed. They are not allowed. We should stay, we should try to stay away from those options. We should start to stay away from those options. So we must not let trespass rankle in our bosom, Chaspojon is saying, by maintaining a sullen silence, nor uh, may we go and publish the matter abroad. So <laughs> publishing the matter abroad is, is, is trying to say, make it public, okay? We must seek out the offender and tell him his fault as if he were not aware of it. Or perhaps he may not be. Most people actually will not distance we think, oh, you have offended me. You find out when you are uh, when you are addressing it, they might not even see it in the same way that you are seeing it. And that matter would be probably finished there with a, a simple apology and it's all over. So that is even why it is more important for us to go and talk to that and talk to that brother. So we will continue next week at the other options when you have talked to your brother and uh, if he has accepted, you have gained him. But there are there will be instances whereby they will not accept. And we'll see what, next week what the Bible says we should do. Praise the Lord. Okay, we'll stop. We'll stop here. We'll stop here for tonight. And then we will uh, continue next week. <laughs>